I think we were looked upon as freaks by people who attended other schools. We must remember the school was meeting a need for scientists. None of us were going to become filmmakers <laughs> or artists. The only freedom we really had was the, the freedom to put ourselves through a regimen that no sane 16-year-old would purposefully do themselves without a lot of social and family pressure. A quarter century ago in the city of New Orleans, a story began that bears directly on issues the nation faces today. It concerns excellence in public education, and it looks back to that period after Sputnik's launch, when the country pressed full steam ahead for better schools and laid particular emphasis on science. That golden age in education brought the nation many benefits, but it also created unanticipated problems which did not become apparent for many years. Because our country is considering a return to rigorous science-oriented curricula, this film looks at some of the lessons from that era in the story of one of its sparkling successes. It examines a program the city of New Orleans started in September 1957. What the city did was renovate this antebellum courthouse behind me and turn it into a public college prep school, public and free. In time, it became one of the top 10 schools, public or private, in the whole country. They named it Benjamin Franklin Senior High. Now is in its third class, the class of 62. I'm uh, Malcolm F. Rosenberg, Jr. For almost 20 years, from 1954 to 1973, I was the assistant superintendent for instruction for the New Orleans public school system. Very early during my tenure, I recognized that one of the groups for which the school system was doing very little was the academically talented. It was as a result of this concern that the Benjamin Franklin Senior High School came into being. At my junior high, there were people who would make fun of you if you made good grades and who would belittle academic achievement. When I tried to achieve in that junior high school, I met a certain amount of resistance from my fellow classmates who had no place, no soft place in their hearts for someone who attempted to excel in the classroom. In order to enter Franklin, one was required to take a battery of achievement tests, an IQ test, and also uh, have the potential for having pretty good grades in school. I'll never forget the very first day in class in Earth Sciences, if you remember that. And Ms. Carey, as the first question, asked everybody in the class to offer whatever knowledge they had about various theories of the creation of the Earth. And Deborah Sternberg raised her hand and said, well, there's always the nebula hypothesis, at which point I was about ready to get up and go over to McDonough High School. But somehow or other, it all worked out nevertheless. I remember the first time in geometry class I did a problem. I thought, oh, wow, I'm going to really shine. I did this problem. You know, I did them all. And I went to class, and everybody else had done it. You know, big deal. And that's when you learn that, hey, these, everybody here is about the same level, which we were. This was not a school for geniuses. The admission requirements were quite broad, okay. primarily just a B average from junior high and an IQ of 120. The hard part was not the getting in, but the staying in. Still, just the decision to attend seemed to set us apart socially and became an issue that each of us had to contend with. When one was a student at Franklin, you were constantly aware that you were somewhat different. There was a certain amount of embarrassment. Perhaps uh, one felt that if one said one went to Franklin, it meant you were trying to impress somebody. There was a certain amount of pride involved. We always had the reputation for being the eggheads or the weirdos. And in fact, during my first year at Franklin, there was still enough friction between ourselves and students at other high schools that carrying your books on the bus with Franklin book covers was likely to precipitate some kind of confrontation. They would ask you what the F is for. We always got called eggheads. And you didn't get it very much until you went out to watch the football games. Well, you'd think that we would retaliate by cursing them out or calling them names or something like that. But instead of 
trying to fight them that way, what we did was we invented a cheer for our football team. And instead of saying, like, hold that line or, or get that ball or something like that, you'd, you'd hear teams saying nowadays, we made up a cheer that went, retard them, retard them, make them relinquish the spheroid. I think Franklin was detested by people who attended other schools, and I think we were looked upon as freaks by people who attended other schools. And I'm somewhat proud of that. Once one got into Franklin, one was required to maintain an 85 average. If there was any pressure at Franklin, I felt like that was it, the 85 average. The 85 average was uh, both the carrot and the stick. Uh, and, you know, if you, you made the 85 average, you stayed in, and if you didn't, you were out. The 85 retention average really, quite honestly, just forced students to work to maintain it. And I feel that if there had not been an 85 average in the early years, if a 75 had been required, I, I, that the students would not have been motivated to, uh, to work as hard as they did. We had a couple of people that made it, went through junior year that did not make the 85 screening. And that, that bothered me because I felt like some of the people that were being weeded out, if you will, were, uh, were some of the more uh, imaginative people, uh, people that were just a little bit out of step with the mainstream. It was so completely arbitrary. You see, you saw people who would leave there with an 83 or an 84 who were, um, well, goodness, you know, they were marvelous people. My name is uh, Richard Janaski. I attended uh, Ben Franklin for two years. In my junior year, I didn't maintain my 85 average, so I wasn't uh, asked back for my senior year. I remember many a Sunday afternoon, sitting home studying, grinding away papers, answering questions at the end of chapters, doing Latin translations while my friends were out running around, having a lot of fun, raising hell, and doing all that stuff that I really wanted to do. There literally was no time to goof off. We were scheduled so tightly. The only freedom we really had was the, the freedom to put ourselves through a regimen that no sane 16-year-old would purposefully do themselves without a lot of social and family pressure. We must remember the school was meeting a need for scientists, what was perceived to be the important thing at that time. There was no choice about what you could do except that you could decide which foreign language you were going to study. We taught the traditional French and Spanish and Latin, but also had German and Russian available. You had to take biology, you had to take chemistry, you had to take physics, you had to take math all three years. I don't remember any nights at all when I didn't take home books or weekends or vacations or anything. We used to take home upwards of 20 pounds of books which was apparently training for later on when you would carry kids on that hip because it was already eroded just perfectly. I would sit there with my English book or math or whatever and start from the time I got home and, and work until I fell asleep or it was time to go to bed. And that would generally be three to four hours per evening. And uh, that was six days a week. What I recall thinking, oh, one night when it was very late and I had to study something, I really wanted to go to bed. I said, no, there's an exam tomorrow. I'm Stuart Wood. I can't do less than an A on that exam. <laughs> and so it was very much a self-generated uh, push. Educators today really are afraid to uh really don't realize the importance of failure. Uh, failure can be the greatest learning experience in the world, and I think that, that so many educators are just uh, determined to, to deny students that experience. At the expense of sounding like Vince Lombardi and all that kind of stuff, like, you know, hardship breeds character and whatnot, but it does. Adversity does breed that, or you fail. You get out. They, you don't succeed. You got to be able to pay the price to do the things you want to do, and Darn it, man. That's, uh, that was part of the Franklin experience. It was a difficult program, but for the most part, it was extremely successful. Interscholastic competitions, such as science fairs, were swept routinely by Franklin students, who consistently won both at the state and at the national level. In the National Merit Scholarship exams, they did exceptionally well, usually providing a majority of the city's winners as well as having one of the highest ratios of winners to class size of schools anywhere in the country. Still another measure of the successfulness of this approach to education was that the White House named more presidential scholars from Franklin than from any other school of any kind in the nation. 
These successes came not only because the school brought under one roof that small handful of students who would have excelled anyway, but more importantly, because the school elicited the best performance possible out of each and every student. As evidence, after Franklin's opening, the total number of National Merit semifinalists in the city's public schools did not stay the same, but in fact tripled. Such continued student achievement brought national prominence to this public southern high school, where, for the price of a streetcar ride, New Orleans kids could go to a school which was becoming ranked as one of the top ten secondary schools in the whole country, joining such exclusive private schools as Choate and Philip Exeter Academy. Back then, those rides were just seven cents. During my junior year, they went up to a dime. And now it's 60 cents. And you've got to have the exact change. I'm Randy Bollinger. After finishing Ben Franklin, I went to Tulane University, where I completed an MD degree, and then went to Duke University in Durham, North Carolina, for a surgery residency, during which time I completed a PhD. This was in preparation for my becoming a transplant surgeon, which I currently am at Duke now. There's no doubt that the science projects that everyone built and, and carried from here on to the regional and state fairs had a big influence on me also. I'm still making science projects, believe it or not. I mean, in, in the course of developing laboratory research proposals, uh, grant proposals, that sort of thing, it's amazingly similar to the kind of work we did as high school students at Ben Franklin. However, despite diligence and exceptional preparation, not everyone found such a direct route to their profession as Randy did. We had all bought the educational stick. We had liked the idea that if you go get um, oodles and oodles of education, there would be a job for you at the end of the road. I'm not so sure that Franklin really gave us the impression that the world should fit our own plans, but I think that it always did promote the notion that our own plans, if well executed, would always fit into the scheme of things. And of course, they don't. I kind of thought that I would wind up going to college somewhere along the line, something would fall in place for me, and I'd just go cruise on down the road. And uh, it uh, never occurred to me that uh, economic reality would just bowl me over. Studies of the immunological characteristics of the transparents and identical albumins are For the first time, our country experienced a massive failure of its national education policy. Because professional careers like science require many years of specialized schooling, the nation's policymakers had fine-tuned our schools and universities so they turned out thousands of highly trained scientists each year. Their failure was in not anticipating the inevitable day when most of the jobs in science would be filled. One of the things that happened to many of us was a severe shift in the job market during the time that we were in graduate school where the demand for PhDs, for example, especially in science, virtually disappeared. It's a dreadfully hard experience to go through your last two years of graduate school knowing that there's no job for you when you finish your PhD. I mean, I hit the very bottom. It wasn't like there were no jobs. There was a negative job market. People were losing their jobs. By the time I had finished the job market for PhDs in chemistry, had virtually shut down completely, and there were jobs neither in industry nor in academia. That led to a succession of postdoctoral appointments and took us to Germany, to Cornell, where I worked with Roald Hoffman, who happened to be this year's Nobel Prize winner, and then took me on to an academic appointment in Kansas City. There I learned that I really did love to teach, but didn't really didn't want to stay in Kansas City. I quit, went back to LSU for a year, to make some hard decisions, at which time I seriously considered for the first time the possibility of an industrial career. I pursued both possibilities during that year and ultimately chose the position I now have with Freeport at the Research and Development Center. It isn't what I really ever thought I was going to do, and it wasn't even what I wanted to do, but I am enjoying it. I went to Princeton, wound up with a master's degree in rocket propulsion and started working for Grumman in the advanced space programs area. Well, of course, this was 1969, I guess, when I started work. 
and by 19, late 1970, it was becoming obvious that there weren't going to be many advanced space programs further on. I wound up being the economist on several other projects, wound up being the economist who studied the uh, energy industries of the United States because we were designing a satellite system to generate power from sunlight, microwave it to Earth. This snowballed, I decided I really wanted to do economics, not only because I liked it, because I, but because I wanted to do something to try to stem the flow of socialism and, and explain the principles of freedom to people. And I thought as an economist I could do that better. I went back for an MBA and that lengthened into a PhD in economics. And through a couple of jumps I wound up teaching at Connecticut, uh, accounting, finance. And then wound up at Tulane two years later. So the career path is, is, is somewhat careening as a random walk as we say in the stock market. <laughs> I took a full-time job at the University Archives six months before I graduated and after serving five years there the uh, went out to the University of Arizona. We had had some success out there but I had decided I didn't want to be at Arizona because they my mentor was gone so I decided to build my old boy network and uh, that guy who wrote the book about what color is your parachute more power to him. I followed the book to a T can't remember the dude's name, but boy, that book is a charm. And uh, I got into it and built those series of contacts and got out there and created my own job, you know, created my own opportunities and uh, landed myself a job as an information and record system consultant uh, in the private sector, something in which I'm really extremely happy about. I mean, you know, I have a lot of academic friends who say, that smacks of, having, of being a real job. I really expected us to be running the country by now, you know, <laughs> and, and we haven't. No, no, not a single one of us won a Nobel Prize for anything, and we're not president of this, and I don't know anybody who's a full professor anywhere. It's, it's fairly shocking to someone whose ego is as large as mine is to see that, that we are thrown out into a world where the, the, the pond is bigger. Inflated expectations aside, Franklin did pretty well by its students. Three out of the 65 have MDs. Ten out of the 65 have PhDs. Eleven are teachers and university workers. Fourteen work in business industry and the law. There's a freelance toy designer, a career diplomat, a professional songwriter, a nuclear submarine commander, and a documentary filmmaker. But focusing attention on college degrees, or upscale careers would overlook an enduring personal benefit. I believe the most important thing that we took away from our years at Franklin was what it taught us about striving and handling challenges, about pushing against our limits. The school made each of us stretch to our full potential day after day, and in the process gave us a faith in ourselves and confidence in our abilities to perform. Nowadays in society, Many housewives seem to be having these identity crises. They seem to be having an awful time dealing with, I'm stuck here at home, or I'm not really doing, what could I be achieving in the, in the world? I feel like I'm the essence of the liberated woman. I mean, I do basically what I want to do. I want to work at the kids' school, I want to work at church, and I want to play tennis, so I play a lot of tennis. You know, the kids come home from school with these little forms to fill out. Every year they come home with them, especially in elementary school. They write down father's name, father's occupation, mother's name, mother's occupation. And I really sort of got tired putting down housewife, because while I do keep house, I don't necessarily think it's the main thing that I do. And about two years ago, I started writing in this little space about, about this big. Uh, instead of writing housewife, I wrote down professional volunteer and amateur tennis player and then let the teacher figure out what that meant from there. I've basically had a can-do attitude. I can remember my husband saying to a friend that when I came over to Germany this time, I was going to get a teaching job. And his friend said, there's no way. They just aren't hiring dependents right now. He said, you don't know my wife. And what he was saying was, if there's a way to do it, I'll find a way to do it. And I think some of that comes from Franklin telling us that we were okay, especially as girls, that we were smart and we could do it as well as anybody else. 
most of us have just a little sense of, well, if we could get through Franklin, if we could do that work, and if we could achieve that much, then we could do it again. I think it's a matter of the fact that we've chosen to do this and have enough confidence in our ability to do outside things that gives us this peace and, and this enjoyment of being able to stay at home and be, quote, quote, just housewives. Incidentally, most of the women combine careers and homemaking. At the 20-year mark, half, 18, are in the workplace, including two PhDs, two nurses, and 10 teachers and college staff workers. Now, this self-confidence that Bonnie speaks of is possibly the most important and enduring benefit we got from our years at Franklin. It is also the unique feature that most of us would not have been able to find in the environment of a normal high school. Here were a group of people protected by these walls of the old courthouse who were free to do the best they possibly could and were stimulated to try to do an excellent job. If we had been at other schools, there would have been people shouting us down. There would have been you know, the gang members who didn't want to listen and, and everybody else who just didn't care. Whereas at Franklin, we were free, as I say, simply to excel. And I think that that was an important thing that maybe broke us loose and allowed us really, to really perform to the best of our ability. There was an ethic at Franklin that learning was important, that it mattered what the truth was. They didn't set a limit on us. Our future was, was unlimited. And that's an attitude that I took from Ben Franklin on into the rest of my education. Once you're, you're enjoying something and you're doing well in it, you tend to want to do even more of that. And I think that's part of the reason that I, I continued in the long medical, surgical, immunology training program, because it was fun along the way. And that's uh, a key factor that I might also have learned at, at Franklin. You have to enjoy yourself as you go. Education is not a guaranteed easy road. You're going to bend your mind out of shape lots of times. And you have to train yourself and have the mental toughness to be able to deal with something that keeps perturbating your system, something that keeps knocking, it out, knocking your point of view askew. And there are some people who are ready for that kind of thing and who can deal with it a lot better than others. But there are, there, there's a time in everybody's life where they at least ought to experience it. And if a child is ready for that kind of thing, they ought to be given a shot at it. <laughs>